Hi, I'm Jackie Emery from Royal Far West, and it's great to be here at the Early Childhood Voices Conference 2020. I'd like you to cast your mind back to the 2019-2020 Australian bushfires that burned through more than 10 million hectares and affected tens of thousands of children and their families. Experiencing a disaster of this nature can have a devastating long-term impact on a child's emotional well-being and development, especially if they're not provided with the right support to process what they've been through in the days, weeks and months following a disaster. The Bushfire Recovery Program began from a powerful desire to help as we joined together for a Royal Far West emergency staff meeting at the very beginning of the year. We returned to work after the dreadful black summer bushfires and the team knew that we wanted to help support the children and families in their recovery. A partnership with UNICEF Australia and through the support of HP and Charles Sturt University made this possible. More recently, the generosity of the Paul Ramsey Foundation has allowed us to extend the support to even more communities. Before we dive into the Bushfire Recovery Program, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Royal Far West. We're a 96-year-old independent charity based in Sydney, dedicated to improving the health and well-being of country kids. We provide health education and disability services for children with developmental challenges, and we work with families, educators and health professionals to build their capacity to support the children in their care. We're also a leader, leading provider of telecare for children in rural and remote communities, and we go where the gaps are working closely with rural communities and local providers, ensuring that we're not doubling up or duplicating services on the ground. After that staff meeting in January of this year, we looked to the research to see what it could tell us about the impact of natural disasters. We learned from the research into other natural disasters, and in particular, our own Black Saturday and Ash Wednesday fires, is that there will be long-term adverse impacts on families because of the event such as mental health issues, domestic violence, substance abuse, child protection issues and financial stress. You can see from the chart that after three years, rates of mental health and PTSD are high and reduce slowly but are still present after 10 years. Regional communities face compounding impacts due to existing social issues such as isolation, disadvantage and a lack of access to services. Perpetrators of domestic violence may take advantage of a victim's isolation and may remove phones, destroy transport or control access to transport, or use firearms as threats. In remote locations and properties, women have nowhere to go and no nearby neighbours or others to ask for help. George and Harris in 2015 quoted a survivor in their study who stated, no one can hear you scream a sentiment echoed by several women in their study. Here are the six national principles to community recovery after a natural disaster. This is how the Bushfire Recovery Program is being rolled out. I would like to pay particular attention, however, to community-led approaches. And what does it actually mean to be community-led? Some key points to keep in mind is that you need to assist and enable individuals, families, and the community to actively participate in their own recovery. You need to recognise that individuals and the community may need different levels of support at different times and be guided by community priorities. Channel effort through pre-identified and existing community assets, including local knowledge, existing community strengths and resilience, and build collaborative partnerships between the community and those involved in the recovery process. Recognise that community leaders often emerge during and after a disaster who may not hold formal positions of authority and recognise that different communities may choose different paths to recovery. Here are the five essential elements of immediate and midterm mass trauma intervention. I'd like to draw your attention to connectedness. As you can imagine, um, COVID on top of bushfires has really presented some big challenges in keeping people connected and giving communities a sense of hope. So who's actually rolling out the Bushfire Recovery Program? Well, 
this is the Royal Far West team that's been assembled to deliver the program. Um, I'm the exec sponsor on the program. Uh, Sarah Eagland is our clinical lead on the program. She was previously the head of our social work team, the clinical care team. Sarah is responsible for the development of the clinical service model um, for the program. And Chris Anderson, um, her colleague and also fellow social worker, is the project coordinator. And Chris has done an amazing job uh, working so closely with schools, um, other agencies on the ground to actually get this program up and running. You can see from um, the other people on, on the list here, I won't name them all, uh, but they're all doing an amazing job working together, working closely with these communities, especially through COVID to sort of pivot and adapt. Um, but it is a multidisciplinary team that is actually delivering on this model. And that's really, really important. And I'll get to that as we start to go through the program service the first step for us in establishing the clinical service model was to conduct the needs assessment and we did that together with UNICEF Australia. UNICEF actually did um, the communities that we wanted to work with on the North Coast and um, Royal Far West and UNICEF together visited the South Coast and a, a range of different communities there. Um, talking to people on the ground to understand what they would need. And really it's about just asking communities what they want. They, they really have a clear idea about what they want. So for example, in Cabago Public School, parents identified the need for support and a location for their grade five and six classes to have a school camp because they lost their um, main source of fundraising due to the cancellation of the Cabago Festival. You can see from um, the photos on this page, um, the devastation, absolute devastation of these bushfires. Um, these photos um, were taken on the south coast around the Cabago area, and it was just an absolute nightmare. But as we've seen in so many fires in the past, some buildings were just left completely untouched and others completely decimated. In the face of all of that devastation, um, people had not lost their sense of humour. Um, even in the most early days, you saw uh, you had a sense of resilience. And um, if you, you look up at the, the top right there, uh, there was a bit of uh, humour in the local library um, post, I don't know whether you can see that, but post-apocalyptic fiction, Move to Current Affairs. And um, you can see here the notice board it was just amazing, people putting messages of support, checking in, um, a lot of the kind of communications were down in this area and people were all coming to uh, the local kind of resource centre to check in and make sure that their friends and family and, and colleagues were, were safe and well and whether people needed anything and any help. Um, you can see our car uh, in this photo um, and, and the fire engines at this, where we were staying, and it was just amazing to listen to some of the conversations of the, the firefighters and how hard they'd been working and um, you know just, just the challenge that was ahead of them. And we were down there actually in the middle still of the bushfires. There were still bushfires happening at that time. So after gathering um, the research, the needs analysis, Sarah went about putting together the project service model and it really was around providing social, psychosocial supports and ongoing mental health um, services uh, to children that were adversely impacted. And so you can see here, um, really the program was about choice. So there was a menu of options so that the community could choose what would best suit their needs. So there were activities to support um, children in a group setting, there were activities to put, uh, support families, um, providing parents with emotion coaching through our Tuning Into Kids program, also using 30 Tree resources, which are absolutely lovely um, books that help parents um, have conversations with their children about this fire um, in a really safe and but hopeful way and also providing professional development and training to educators um, and local services on the ground and um, part of the model involves us, us actually co-presenting um, some of these services uh, with local services. And in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, for a limited number of schools, we were actually able to find funding um, to provide 
some residential recreational um, camps on site in our hub in Manly, which will provide these communities with, with great respite. Obviously, we haven't been able to do that yet because of the COVID impacts, but really hoping to have those school um, excursions happening uh, next year in 2021. So working with our funders, um, we had to set some goals and targets um, to ensure that we were meeting community needs, but also um, really relevant outcomes. So with UNICEF Australia, we agreed to cover at least eight regions, um, provide 500 children with direct psychosocial support, 50 children um, to provide ongoing intensive mental health support, and reaching 1,600 parents, carers, educators, health professionals, and other relevant community members uh, with psychosocial supports um, to obviously to provide uh, the best kind of care and support for their children. Paul Ramsey Foundation allowed us to cover an additional three regions, um, provide another 200 children with direct psychosocial support, um, target another 25 children uh, with that intensive mental health support and reaching an additional 400 parents, carers and educators. So it's been a very busy um, six to almost nine months now and uh, a lot of what we've had to do in this time is look at the service model that was created and try and adapt to what COVID threw at us. We had planned community visits before the end of the financial year. That was obviously put on hold. And so we really had to find creative ways um, to still engage with these communities and provide them with some supports as opposed to just waiting to when we could get into community. Because of our experience and knowledge of telehealth, we were able to run uh, a number of educator workshops um, uh, with schools that we had been um, organised with and it really allowed us to co collaborate deeply with other services that were on the ground and work out um, what we could do uh, to ensure that there was little duplication and crossover of services and there are a lot of services in there but coordinating them is really, really important. We also had to um, invest in training and upskilling of our clinical team to ensure that they could actually do this. This is a new kind of trauma. We're used to dealing in trauma with trauma in children, but a community-wide trauma is a very different kind of trauma. And so, um, you know, we sought guidance from experts all around the world, including um, the team that, uh, that responded to the Grenfell fire in London to provide us uh, with training and upskilling. Here's just some of the training that the team have gone through, and it's been incredible professional development um, for our clinical uh, team leaders and, and staff at Royal Far West. Um, we even had Professor Sandra McFarlane, who's a currently an advisor to New South Wales Health and Bushfire Recovery, and Professor Richard Bryant that had done uh, some of that longitudinal research um, off the uh, Black Saturday fires. And um, the, the training, e even with COVID, uh, was incredibly successful and the team just got such a, a, an amazing amount out of it and felt incredibly prepared to be able to deliver services um, when we were fortunate enough to get back into community. Here are the regions that we're targeting our support to in the Bushfire Recovery Program. You can see the pink regions are funded by UNICEF and the blue are funded by Paul Ramsey Foundation. We're really aiming to work with um, two, generally two schools and a preschool um, in each of these regions. And uh, we will be working with those schools uh, over the course of the next 12 months to support them, uh, their staff and the children in those communities. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that we have actually started our community visits. Last term, the team were in Grafton and up around um, Glen Innes area uh, delivering the program and are now in um, on the south coast and uh, will be there really for the whole of term four, um, delivering into about 14 different communities. So we're well and truly underway with those community visits and, and really just in time as well. Um, the cracks are really starting to show. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier, but the research also tells us that uh, the majority of children uh, do not start presenting 
uh, with long-term adverse impacts until 26 months after the fire event. So, um, you know, really being there at this time is critically important, especially as we start to enter the next bushfire season. I did just want to touch on the creativity and the agility shown by the bushfire team when COVID hit. Um, we started by commencing um, educator workshops, under, trying to understand the needs of the school. We provided them with a school questionnaire. We ran a series of workshops with them. Often the feedback was just, we know there's information available, but don't have the time or headspace to explore it. Really, they were just trying to manage day to day, getting children safely back to school um, and trying to establish a sense of normality. Um, we also um, started to uh, provide care education and client with children that were already known to RFW services who were impacted by the bushfires. This had included a session with familiar cl clinicians to the family to understand the family's personal experience, offering knowledge around human response to trauma and often validated, validating the challenges carers were reporting um, to be normal responses. We also commenced weekly OT and psychology support um, to children um, that were identified just also on OT, so um, for those of you that aren't aware, OT includes movement, breathing, play, checking in with the senses, fostering child carer relationships and establishing routines. And the aim is to give clients practical tools that can be used to support their regulation and sense of calmness as part of that recovery process. So what does all this mean for um, children and families that were caught up in these bushfires. I'd like to introduce you to Jack. So Jack is 10. He lives with his family in a small town on the south coast. He's in year five at the local primary school and outside school he enjoys playing with his pet cats, designing new Lego pieces and making cubby houses and riding his scooter. During the summer of 2020, the bushfires burned very close to Jack's home and he had to evacuate several times and, and that's quite a common story. The fires got so close that they burnt right up to their neighbour's backyard. Jack's mum, Katie, had to act quickly and she arranged for Jack and James to stay with their grandmother up the coast. Unfortunately, the, sp the fires spread close to that town too. Jack and James had to escape for a second time and shelter at the local surf club evacuation centre. This was very frightening for the boys, especially because Jack was worried about his mum and family who were staying at another town. Jack was also very worried about his pet cats. He hoped they were keeping safe. Once home, they were relieved to see that their house hadn't been burned, but it was full of smoke and ash and they had no electricity for several days. A thick smoke stayed for weeks and they couldn't play outside. Jack's mum said that the children seemed fine initially, but as time went on, she became increasingly worried about them. Jack's younger sister had become very clingy and was refusing to sleep in her own bed. Jack was very quiet and withdrawn, nervous and would startle easily. Jack's teacher said he was struggling to concentrate and he was quiet. Katie said she felt overwhelmed and nervous for much of the time herself, and she knew that this was also impacting on the children. Royal Far West provided information on resources and services that could help, including stories to read with the children. The family also enjoyed a visit to Royal Far West in Manly. Katie was supported with information about the impact of natural disaster trauma on children and resources and ideas regarding how best to support them. Staff from the Bushfire Recovery Program will be visiting Jack's local school to offer support to his teachers. In the meantime, Jack and his family are supported via telecare with occupational therapy and psychology sessions. So Jack's story um, is, is a common story. Um, and for us, really, the goal of this program is to ensure that we can prevent Jack from having those long-term adverse impacts by working with his family, working with his teacher, and working closely with Jack to um, rebuild his resi resilience and provide Jack with a sense of hope so that he can have a full recovery. 
finally, a big shout out to our partners. We couldn't do this bushfire recovery program without them. Thank you to UNICEF, Paul Ramsey Foundation, CSU, who are about to start the evaluation of this program, HP, who have donated a lot of end user computing so that no child should be without a service. And finally, to Little Wings, who are currently flying the bushfire recovery program team all about the countryside so that they can deliver this program. Thanks for listening.